Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Um, if you're a visitor, welcome on behalf of Spirit of Life Congregation. We'll, uh, we have a visitor today and um, would like to draw your attention to an important housekeeping note. If your phone rings, we'll extend Pastor Je um, Jeff's sermons by 15 more minutes. Um, so for our gathering today, not only can God never be fully comprehended, but the ironic truth is that much of, if not most of what you might come to perceive about God can be encountered only in the very act of following God. The road itself is the teacher. Welcome. So I'm sorry, guys. We'll go one step backwards. That's what happens when the pastor is on vacation and our <laughs> pianist is not feeling well today. Thank you, Loretta. Cool. We'll make this work today. Amen. Amen. 
All right, so uh, back to our welcome and then we're gonna move on, okay? Um, we'd like to welcome a, a visiting pastor today and um, he is an executive at the Presbyter from the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area and the Reverend Jeff Japinga. And then a couple of announcements. Um, we have an Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday night, and it begins at 7 p.m. And I believe there will not be a meal and on uh, this Wednesday, right? Okay. And then in the bulletin, I believe there's an order for Easter flowers. So we're taking orders through next week. And so we're going to get into a call to worship and then move on to time with children. Eric, thank you for bearing with us. <laughs> Today we journey to a mountaintop, sharing a moment of wonderment, a moment of clarification. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Come as we prepare to listen. Come as we get ready to see anew. Come and find renewal. Let us worship God. So I guess we can move on to the time with our children. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So this Wednesday, we do not have M&M. And why do we not have M&M, Michaela? Because it's Ash Wednesday. Right, it's Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent. And Lent is all about getting prepared for Easter. During Lent, we think about Jesus dying for us on the cross before he rose again on Easter Sunday. During Lent, some people choose to give up something. We call that making a sacrifice, just like Jesus did when he was put on the cross. And some people choose to give during Lent to help others as Jesus helped us. Well, this year during Lent, we are asking all of our children to do a little bit of both. How many of you get an allowance? No? How many of you maybe go to Target or the grocery store and you might say to your mom or dad or grandma and grandpa, oh, can, I, can you buy me that treat? Can you buy me that toy? Yeah, okay, more hands. Okay, good. Or how many of you maybe have some spending money at home, some quarters, some dollars, and you spend it on yourself? Well, what I'm going to start having you do, what I want to start doing is on starting on Wednesday, I would like you to think about collecting some of that money that you usually spend on yourself or that you usually ask your mom and dad for and bring it to church on Sundays and Wednesdays during M&M. And we're going to have that be the sacrificing part of Lent where you're going to give up maybe buying something for yourself and bringing your money to church, whether it's just a penny a nickel, a dime, quarters, whatever you might have. And then we will collect your money every, um, and we'll have a collection every Wednesday night at M&M and every Sunday morning. And that's what these two bowls are for. So there'll be one in each classroom. So we'll have and we'll collect our money. And every week we'll keep adding more and more of our money into here. And then by Easter Sunday, we'll see how much money we have. Then we're going to count it all up and see how much money we have, and then we're going to give the giving part of Easter. So Loretta had shared about how years ago we used to give money around Easter time, and we would send it over to people that live in other countries that would like to buy some farm animals. And they need those farm animals to help them feed not only themselves, but to feed their community too. So at M&M or Sunday school after Easter, we're going to count all of our money. We're going to see how much we have, and then we're going to send it over there. Maybe we can buy some chickens, or maybe we can buy some bunnies, or maybe even part of a cow. I don't know who will pay for the other part, but maybe we'll pay for part. 
get that out? The cows are expensive. <laughs> okay, so do you think we can do that? Yeah. Okay, so between now and Easter, do you remember how many days Lent is? About 40? About 40 days, yep. 40 months? That'd be a long time, Jake. <laughs> That'd be a lot of money. Then maybe we could buy a cow if we had 40 months. Maybe we could afford a cow then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll start working on that on M&M &M and starting on Sunday. So next Sunday, since there's no M&M &M this week, okay? All right, are you ready to pray with me? Dear God, you give us so many good things. Help us to remember that during Lent this season, we will be kind loving, in giving to those around us. Amen. Thank you, Nikki. We're looking forward to the chicken and half a cow for Easter. <laughs> Our prayer of reconciliation. Holy God, God of life, hear our prayer. Forgive us when we follow those paths that do not lead to life, but instead too often produce violence or hate or fear. Forgive us when we forget that you offer us life that is abundant and internal, life that began at the creation of all things and carried your people throughout all generations. Forgive us, turn us to the right path, and let your love and grace flow over us and the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. A moment of silence. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the only one of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor, and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified suffering the deaths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or death can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. In that forgiveness, Christ invited us, not simply to take it for ourselves, but to share it with others, to share the peace that we understand in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so I invite you in this time to do exactly that. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of that peace with one another.
I guess the kids can go to Sunday school now. <laughs> A prayer of illumination. Dear God of our journey, help us to have ears and hear the eyes to see today in our climb up to the mountain. In your word, may we be strengthened in faith following you from the mountain top down here to the valley to better love and care for one another. Holy Spirit, may we know deep within our hearts your love. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Galgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord leaves, and you yourself leave, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them. And as they both were standing by the Jordan, then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, I will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, but we could no longer see him. He grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. You heard Nikki Child tell the children that this is the final Sunday before the beginning of Lent, which begins on Ash Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Traditionally, in the church, for centuries, the final Sunday before the beginning of Lent is known as Transfiguration Sunday. And we read the same story out of Scripture. And so we'll do that again today. It's a story that if you've been in the church for a while, you've heard before. You've heard many times. And so I invite you to listen again for the first time. Listen again to a familiar story and see what you hear. And, and 
I'm going to have you do it in a certain way. Okay, uh, folks back at the sound desk, I'm going to mess with you just for a moment. See this text? Ignore it. So the, the transfiguration story is told twice. It's told in Mark, and it's also told in Matthew. And because Rob and I weren't entirely on the same wavelength this week, Matthew is there. No, Mark is there, and Matthew is here. <laughs> so I'm going to read Matthew. And so you won't be able to follow along. But listen, it's the same story. There are slight differences, however. Listen for the word of God then, as it's recorded in the Gospel according to Matthew, the 17th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, there appeared before all of them Moses and Elijah, who we just read about, talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With Him I am well pleased. Listen to Him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Get up. Do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus said to them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words which I speak and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, so what do you make of this story that we just read? Other than that it is bizarre and incredible and holy all wrapped up in one. What do you make of this story? What we call the transfiguration of Jesus. What do you make of it? Not, not simply for the disciples up on the mountaintop, not simply, how would you explain this? What do you make of it for you and for Spirit of Life Presbyterian Church? What happened, what we read, is clear enough if, if in fact, anything about this story is clear. Four people take a trek up a mountain 
alone. Suddenly there's this, this something happens. There's dazzling white clothes and bright lights and the appearance of Moses and Elijah. The disciples say, let's build some buildings. There's a voice from heaven. The disciples faint to the ground. And amidst all of that, I mean, just think about that. Amidst all of that, Jesus then says, the six most simple, ordinary, impossible words you could imagine. Get up. Do not be afraid. Get up. Do not be afraid. Sure, right, of course. We've just seen all of this and we're not supposed to be afraid. Are any of us not afraid just because someone tells us not to be afraid? And yet, and yet, do not be afraid is what we hear throughout the Bible. Do you remember what the angel said to Mary when the angel told Mary that she would bear a son and that son would be Jesus? Do not be afraid. What did the angels tell the shepherds on the hilltops? Do not be afraid. What did the angel tell the women who were first at the tomb on Easter morning? Do not be afraid. Someone counted, and apparently, and I'm a little dubious, but apparently there are, in the Bible, 365 instances of someone saying, do not be afraid. I'm a little dubious because the number is too convenient. And most of those times, most of those times, the phrase is uttered when we have every right to be afraid. Think about those disciples. Think about this story and what they saw and how they must feel. Think about not just what happened on that mountain, but what they had been seeing now for nearly three years in their travels with Jesus. Demons cast out, lepers healed, a girl brought back from death to life, Jesus walking on water, and 5,000 people fed from a small picnic basket. But they had also seen Jesus run out of Nazareth by an angry mob. They'd seen John the Baptist killed by Herod. Religious leaders had begun to challenge Jesus and in turn, Jesus had with them begun to predict his own death. Think about that. And then think about the experience that we just read about this morning. In one stunning moment, Jesus goes dazzling white, Moses and Elijah, the two biggest names in the history of their faith, suddenly appear and are talking with Jesus. And out of the clouds comes a voice that they could only assume to be the voice of God. And then just as quickly, it's done. And Jesus says to them, you can't talk about this. I don't know about you, but I think it would be hard not to be afraid in that time. Just like for our own lives, it's often hard not to be afraid. You fear a job loss, there's an accident, 
There's the end of a significant relationship. There's a child's rebellion. There's an illness or death. There's a D on a math test. There's a rejection from your first choice in college. We lay awake, we lay awake at night and we worry about what the next day might bring. We worry whether we have enough money for rent or retirement. We're afraid of climate change. We're afraid of the direction of this country. We're afraid. And it's hard not to be afraid. And in those moments, in those moments of our own fear, don't we want what the disciples wanted? They wanted something safe and stable. Some kind of assurance that everything was going to be okay. And so they said, let's build something. Something solid. Something that will protect us from what makes us afraid out there. Perhaps the greatest transformation that takes place on this mountain is not Jesus turning dazzling white or Moses and Elijah appearing or even God's voice from the clouds. But what that experience did for the disciples, for their own understanding of who they were and this journey that they were on, the healings and the crowds and the miracles they'd seen, as astounding as all of those things were, those were all things that they could celebrate things that were really cool and good and wonderful. The experience up on that mountaintop was something different. They saw Jesus in a whole new light. A light that left them terrified and tongue-tied. But in seeing Jesus in that way, they also began to see themselves and their lives in a whole new light too. Beginning with the hard truth that Jesus did not want his closest disciples to simply stay in a safe place far above the chaos and the needs of the world. Rather, Jesus, in this experience, in telling them to get up, to not be afraid, was calling them to confront the very things that made them afraid. And he says the same to us as well. It was just 10 days before she was to defend her dissertation that my friend Diana got the phone call. Cancer, the doctor said. An aggressive form and you have only a 20% chance that you will survive it for five years. She was, as you might imagine, afraid that night. In a dream, she reports, in a dream I saw a bright light and I heard the words, do not be afraid. And in that moment, it seemed to me to be the most impossible advice I had ever gotten. Eleven years later was when I heard that story. For the last decade, she said, my mantra has simply been, get up and be of use. It's the motto I live by when my opportunities are too big and my capacities and capabilities are too small. 
It's not always easy. It's often hard. I pray every day not to be afraid. A few years ago, this presbytery had little buttons printed up. They said, we fearlessly follow the Holy Spirit into a changing world. But we also had a debate on whether we were as fearless as our buttons said we were or whether we were more fearful about what we did. My, my wife Jen is here with me today. She will tell you if you ask her that her husband is not always very good at being fearless. That there are often times when he lays awake at night worried about those things he probably can't even change and maybe a few of them that he can as well. The life to which God calls us is not always an easy one. Neither are we always fearless. Which means that maybe what is most true in this story is not so much the takeaway that we are supposed to be the bravest or the most courageous person you know, or able to explain our way through all of those hard things that happen in life. Maybe it's far more simple than that. That even when it seems impossible, the invitation from Jesus is right there before us. The invitation to get up. Do not be afraid. I can't explain why some people do that better than others. Why some who have seen death up close can so fully embrace life. Why some who have been so egregiously wronged can still offer forgiveness. Why some people extend generosity without any thought of being paid back. If you ask them, they often don't know either. Except that in the midst of what made them most afraid, they too heard the invitation of Jesus to do something that they necessarily could not do themselves. Get up. Don't be afraid. This Wednesday is the beginning of Lent. A journey. A journey of preparation to the cross and to the resurrection. Each year we enter the time of Lent knowing exactly what we will see at the end, but perhaps not what we will see along the way. And yet we're willing to set off on this journey because we've heard something so compelling about our traveling partner that we simply cannot stay behind. This is my son, the beloved, Listen to him. As the disciples discovered again on the top of that mountain, it is exactly in those moments when the settled lives that they had constructed for whatever reason become unsettled. Perhaps for you not in a way as dramatic as Moses and Elijah standing next to you but in the ordinary hopes and encounters and tragedies of our everyday lives. It's in those moments that transfiguration points us forward. How will you choose to frame the experiences of your life, the story 
that transfiguration invites us to confront? How will you face the situations you most fear? Jesus invites us to get up, to not be afraid, to walk and journey and live into the wonder and mystery of God and that he will be present with us each day calling us to courage and the promise of new and abundant life. The disciples, the disciples got up and followed Jesus down off that mountain. Down off that mountain into the challenges that they knew they were going to face in the coming weeks and months. We know those challenges for ourselves. Not only the challenges that the disciples faced, but the ones that we face too. Every day and every week and every month of our lives. Challenges that we can't always control. Challenges that will make us afraid. And so in the coming weeks and months, As we journey through Lent, I invite you to hear the invitation of Jesus during this time and throughout your lives. Get up. Get up. Do not be afraid. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. There is so much about life that we don't know and that we can't control, oh God. And admittedly, that often makes us afraid. Give us the courage and the attentiveness in this time of Lent to renew our walk with Jesus and to look for his presence in all that we do and say, and in all the places we are. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. call to offering. 
Lord of transformative change, accept these our offerings and by the addition of your spirit transform what we give to support the work of your kingdom here in our community and across the world. Amen. May the ushers please come forward to receive the morning's offering. I had this happen to me last week, too. I just want you to know. No, t two weeks, thank you. Two weeks ago, I was at, a, at one of our churches in, in St. Paul, and right during the middle of my sermon, we blew a fuse, and it went boom, like that. So, so it's my fault. Just, okay? Um, you can build a presbytery for it. You know, I, I was going to say, um, before I preached, that if anyone wanted to contribute $500 to the youth fund that I would have only gone five minutes, but I forgot. So I hope that, <laughs> I hope that one of you didn't want to do that. Um, we, D Jen and I were here for your cabaret. It was, it was great. Um, and, and we too were happy to support what your youth are doing. It's a great thing that they are doing and it's fabulous that you're a congregation that's encouraging that kind of work and that kind of mission, and that kind of involvement from your young people. Thank you for that. 500 bucks, I won't come back again, okay? <laughs> A thousand, I will, whatever, whatever you want. Um, let's approach God in prayer. Part of your tradition is to name some of those prayers from out of your, out of your own congregation. And, and you have done that again this week. So let me just share those with you as we enter this time of prayer. And I'm going to add one to it, okay? And so um, Mark, Mark, my cousin, who was our ring bearer nearly 54 years ago. So you can figure out who might not have sent this in. <laughs> 54 years ago, is hospitalized with a large mass under his sternum and lungs, surgery will be early in the week. It will be like open heart surgery. This is a big deal. Prayers for the medical team, for a successful surgery and recovery, and for Mark's family also. And so we will. Who is Adoso? Adosas? Is that right? Is that right? Is it, did, did I do that right or wrong? Adosa? Adosa? Yeah. And you just had your 17th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> do you sing here? Do you ever do that? Can you, come here, come here. 
Yeah, you have to keep, yeah, you do, you do. All right, folks, um, do you play along or do we do this a cappella? We'll do this a cappella. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Adosa. Happy birthday to you. We give thanks for Adosa, for life, for another year. And we pray for the influence that she will have over this next year on those who love her and those she loves. Um, prayers for family and friends of a young man whom paramedics attempted to resuscitate Wednesday night at Egan Community Center, but without success. I'll add one thing, if, you, if we may, for our prayers. Um, my older sister, Jody, um, is, is battling cancer right now, second time around. She had some scans taken on Thursday, and she'll learn tomorrow what they read. And so for her and her family, we pray for healing and for peace. Let us enter into a time of prayer. Let us pray. For your love, O oh God, for your promised presence, for our ability to approach you with the longings of our heart, we give you thanks. There is so much about which we pray, so much about what we are concerned, so much about life that challenges us. And in the midst of it all, you give us this opportunity to pray, to ask of you what we long for in our hearts. And so we do. We pray for this church. We pray for this church and its witness in the community. We pray for this church and the impact that it's having. We pray for Pastor Rob and his leadership. And we give you thanks for we know that the influence and impact of this place is strong and growing. And we ask for your guidance in how it can remain that way. We pray for our country. We pray for the ways in which it is the land that we love and we pray for the ways in which it is divided and fractured. We pray especially for those who in whatever way have been left behind, for those who are hungry, for those who do not have a place to live, for those who in the silence of their own lives suffer. We pray for them for your spirit to be with them, and for your guidance on how we can make a difference in one particular place. And that there are others out there who can make a difference in their own places too. We pray for our world. We pray for a world consumed with fear around a virus that has taken lives and sheltered towns and cities. We pray for all of those seeking a way through the coronavirus. We pray for peace. We pray for peace in troubled places, for a potential peace treaty in Afghanistan, for, for the troubled country that is Cameroon. We pray for peace peace of Christ that passes all understanding. We pray for ourselves.
and we pray for those we love that we may continue to know your love and guidance and care in all that we do each and every day. We pray that we hear your voice to follow you, to journey with you, even into places that make us afraid. All of this we pray. All of this we pray using the words that Jesus taught us to pray, that we say together and out loud. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debt. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. sit down. Get up. <laughs> Get up. I don't know what life will be for you this week or through the journey of Lent. It may be scary. It may be good. It may be wonderful. It may be hard. But to all of life, Jesus says, Get up. Get up. Do not be afraid. Why? 
because I go with you through all of life. And so with that ringing in our ears, go in peace. Go in peace and love one another as God first loved you. Proclaim to all who will hear the good news of Christ's coming. Keep faith in all you do. And may the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, go with you today and every day. Amen.